Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. Before I even get started with the show, let me wish all of my listeners a happy holidays and a joyous new year filled with happiness, peace, and libraries. Thank you all so much for listening to me rattle on, and I hope you that you've, uh, you know, that you've enjoyed this year of Cyberpunk Librarian, and I'm looking forward to a whole new year of the podcast. So whether you're a longtime fan or a brand new listener, thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see all of you next year. It's the holiday season. And librarians know what that means. E-reader classes. As people get shiny new Kindles, iPads, Android tablets, or even, God forbid, Nooks as presents, uh, libraries will fill up on classes on how to use them and what you can do with them. I thought about doing a show on e-readers, but then I thought, nah, there'll be enough e-readers in librarians' futures for a little while now. Let's do something different. Let's talk about something you need when you're setting up a small library. Maybe it's a nonprofit with a room full of books and materials that they'd like to lend out. Perhaps it's a church library. It could even be a school library where they have the books but nothing to manage them. In the end, you need something that makes a library, well, go. You need a method of cataloging things, checking them out to patrons, checking them in, maybe even putting them on hold. In short, you need an integrated library system, or an ILS. But these things aren't cheap, right? I mean, libraries pay hundreds of thousands of dollars per year for their ILS. They're deeply complex things, and there's no way one or two people could manage one, let alone afford one, right? Now, dear listener, how long have you been with this show? Do you really think I'm going to advise you to look into Sierra, Millennium, Polaris, VTLS, or Encore, or something like that? Of course not. Let's look at some easy-to-use, free, and open-source alternatives. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 40, All I Want for Christmas is an ILS. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that is all about exploring the intersections of libraries and technology and living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, happy holidays, and Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the air, back on the fiber, and burning up your smartphone with an end-of-the-year episode. Winter has come to the land of Az, and baby, it's cold outside. Now, I know, I know, I know, it's not exactly Fargo, North Dakota out there, but it ain't Melbourne, Victoria either. People always talk about how Phoenix has a dry heat, which is why it's pretty tolerable outside, even when it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 degrees Celsius for the right-thinking part of the world. That also translates into a dry cold where the temperature drop sucks all of the moisture out of your skin, and you wind up with cracks and bleeding, and it's all kinds of no fun. So to, uh, to keep myself warm, I hit up the coffee shops, the co-working spaces, my office, and of course a couple libraries here and there to do some research, a little writing, and bring you a show about free, open-source ILS solutions. Now then, before we go farther, let me explain to my non-librarian listeners out there what an ILS is. So an ILS is an integrated library system. This is the computer software that makes the library work. It's a total package of multiple modules that allow for acquiring items for the library, cataloging them, checking them out and in, um, adding and managing patrons, putting a catalog online. ILS systems can be these complex behemoths that require lots of people with different skill sets to properly use it. They, uh, they also tend to cost a truckload of money. But what if you're working with a small organization? Like I said, a nonprofit or a school, you know, they've, they've got a small library that might benefit from an ILS. 
but they don't have a truck, and let alone one filled with money. Worse yet, chances are their library team consists of only three people, you, yourself, and the. So you're faced with a situation where you could use an ILS, but there's just not a lot of money, and there aren't a lot of people to do all the work that's usually associated with a full-blown ILS. So you don't just need a free and open source solution, you need an easy to use one too. Thankfully, such things exist, and we're going to talk about a couple of them here today, but first, a couple caveats. When you simplify something as complex as an ILS, you make trade-offs. Sometimes those trade-offs are really great, and other times they could be deal-breakers. For instance, one of the systems I'm going to talk about doesn't use Mark, like, at all. For me, that's a plus, because I think Mark sucks for various reasons. Once again, for the non-library folks, Mark is M-A-R-C, and it's short for Machine Readable Catalog Record. It was developed in the uh, 1960s, and it looks like it. However, librarians did update the format in 1999 to a version called Mark 21, and it, and it too looks like it was developed in the 1960s. My opinions aside, you know, because my opinions don't matter in this situation, Mark is the dominant format for cataloging li library materials in the Western world, if not worldwide. Anyway, you might have to ditch Mark, but given the fact that you might be looking for an ILS that's easy to use, I think that's a good thing. Others might differ, but, you know, you don't need Mark to define something. You simply need a database with standard fields that people can understand. And we've got that today. Or, if you like, we're going to talk about a feature-rich ILS that's full-on Mark-compatible, complete with online catalog, staff interface, permission sets, and all of that stuff. But with great complexity comes great undertaking. So keep in mind how much work you can do, or more importantly, how much work you might want to do. But I'm all about choices, which is why I'm taking sort of both sides of the spectrum here and delivering them to you. So, okay, enough of that. Let's kick this thing into high gear and do something life-changing. Uh, maybe we'll just install and set up an ILS instead. Let's start easy and we can build from there. After all, I think a majority of us want and need to get things done with a minimal amount of effort and setup and headache. It's no secret that I really like WordPress. Uh, after all, the Cyberpunk Librarian site runs on WordPress and it's been an outstanding CMS for the last few years. One of the greatest things about WordPress is that after you get the vanilla installation done, you can add all kinds of functionality to it with plugins. You want to add a slider? Well, there's a plugin for that. Do you want to add more options when it comes to images? They've got plugins. Need an events calendar? Plugins. Do you happen to need an easy to use ILS that integrates directly into WordPress using either an existing site or a site totally dedicated to the ILS? Yeah, they've got that too. Let me introduce you to Web Librarian a plugin for WordPress that enables a set of easy-to-use tools to create an ILS right there within the CMS. So you'll be able to assign roles with different permission sets to keep things a bit more secure, but also allow for each role to perform necessary tasks. That's great when you're doing all the setup, while someone else might actually be using the software. Beyond that, you can add multiple types of items to the catalog, set lending periods, create and manage patrons, check stuff out and in, place holds, deal with fines, and so on. Better yet, Web Librarian doesn't use Mark, instead opting for a simpler system of cataloging your collection. Now, I won't lie. Setting up any ILS takes time. If you are looking at a room full of books and DVDs and whatnot, you are looking at a room full of work. However, 
Web Librarian offers some tools to make things easier on that front. For instance, you're able to import data from spreadsheets in a comma-separated variable or CSV format, and that can make life easier. So let's dive into this for a bit. So setting up Web Librarian is like setting up any other WordPress plugin. You can do it with the CMS, or you can download the package and upload it manually. I kind of just prefer to do everything within WordPress, because it's sort of been designed for that, and it works really well. Log in as a WordPress admin, and then pop into your plugin setting and add a new one. Search for Web Librarian, and it should be the top of the list. Oh, and that's Web Librarian as two words, not that comical thing where computer people sometimes stick two words together and then just capitalize properly. That's weird. But anyway, as an aside, you can pick up links to the plugin, the documentation, and the plugin's website in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Check out the info and see what all this thing does. Anyway, install the plugin and you'll notice that, well, not a lot seems to happen. But there's a reason for that, and it all comes down to the roles within Web Librarian. See, the plugin is really good at separating your library and pack from your website. So your admin user, they're not actually a library user, and they're not listed as a librarian. So let's do a couple things now that we're installed. One, check the settings in WordPress for Web Librarian. If you happen to have a uh, Amazon AWS public and private key along with an associates tag, you can set up Web Librarian to do some automatic metadata lookup. You don't need this, and the plugin works fine without it, but hey, if you've got it, use it. Two, get into your user administration and set up some new users. At the very least, you'll need a user with the role of librarian, and this is an actual WordPress role assigned to the user. It comes with the plugin. If you need further users, Web Librarian has the roles of librarian, senior aide, and volunteer. A librarian is basically the ILS administrator, but it's important to note that they are not the site or WordPress administrator. Uh, when I was fiddling with this, I typically had a browser open in incognito mode so I could sign into both accounts as needed. The librarian has access to all of the functionality from cataloging to circulation. The senior aide, on the other hand, can manage the collection and handle the circulation. And finally, the volunteer can only do circ-related stuff, like checking things out and handling holds. Once you've got those things set up, you're going to need to do one more thing to get your online catalog ready. Web Librarian uses a few WordPress shortcodes to display your pack. There are multiple options, but if you check the documentation, they've got a basic layout that's all ready for you to use. If you're going to, uh, you're going to need to decide where these shortcodes go, really, because in WordPress, they can kind of go anywhere. For me, I simply put it on a page called OPAC, which is short for Online Public Access Catalog. If you'd like to see a very basic, sort of quickly set up version of a web librarian pack, visit cyberpunklibrarian.com slash OPAC, that's O-P-A-C. The great thing about the shortcode is that it's pulling information from your database on the fly. So if things change, well, so will your pack. Additions will show up automatically, as do status changes. So if you want my advice, I would set up your site as a sort of standard blogging site or, you know, something like that, where you can post fresh content, events, all of that stuff. Then provide prominent links to your pack. Using the shortcodes, you could even pop a pack search onto your front page. Okay then, so now that we're, you know, kind of sort of set up, and keep in mind that you can make changes. You know, if, if, you, uh, if you set something up and decide you don't like it the way it is, well, by all means, change it. But now that we're kind of, you know, got things basically set up, let's fire this thing up. Log into the WordPress site as a librarian user. And remember, librarian is a role assigned in WordPress user administration. So it could be any user or a specific user or what, whatever works for you. Log in with that user, and you'll notice that your admin panel is a bit different. Instead of the normal options down the side of your admin panel, you have things like patrons, collection, circulation types, circulation desk, 
and circulation stats. You are now in the web librarian ILS interface, so let's take a look around. Adding a new patron or managing a patron means filling out some basic information. The new patron form includes patron ID, which is presumably a barcode number, telephone, last name, first name, extra name, which I guess could be a middle name or a nickname, address one and two, city, state, zip, outstanding fines, and expiration date, which defaults to five years. Fill all that in and hit add patron, and you've got your first patron to play with. I made a test account so I had something to work with and kind of just see how things shook out. The collection tab is just that, your collection. We're going to come back to that in a sec because before you start adding materials to your collection, you kind of need to set up some circulation types, which you can do under the next menu, conveniently labeled circulation types. A circulation type defines the parameters for the materials in your collection and designates their type. There are two simple questions to answer. What's the name of the type and what's the loan period? In my simple system, I created a few types like adult fiction, adult nonfiction, CD, and DVD. I set everything to have a loan period of 21 days except for the DVD, which has a seven day lending period. Now, you could do something totally different and set it up as, say, books, DVDs, pamphlets, zines, whatever. At the very least, you're going to have to figure out what you have and how long it checks out. Then you need to figure out how you differentiate that from the other stuff. Once you have your circulation type set up, keeping in mind that you can change things as you need to, let's take a look at adding things to the collection, because when you add something to the collection, you don't have to naff about with mark records. You just need to fill in some blanks. A new item asks for a barcode, title, author, subject, description, category, media, publisher, publisher location, publishing date, edition, ISBN, type, which is the circulation type we just talked about, a thumbnail URL for the cover image, call number, and keyword tags. Of these, only the title, author, subject, and type are actually required. Everything else is at your discretion. Also, if you set up the Amazon AWS thing earlier, It'll help you pull information from Amazon for these fields. Either way, I just popped over to Amazon and did some copy pasting. I don't personally have an AWS key. Next up is the circulation desk, which, no surprise, lets you handle the circulation tasks like checking in and out, placing holds, checking your patron accounts, and so on. The workflow is a little different than what you may be used to, but it's not bad. If I have a complaint, it's that the user interface here is a little jumbled. So to check out, you look up a patron by name or barcode, or you can just select them from a drop-down list. Once they're on screen, you can see their account and then scan or type the barcode of an item into the box above to check it out. Checking in is also done on the same screen, but by clicking a different button. It's a little odd, but once I played with it for a few minutes, I was able to see, you know, how things worked and what worked and stuff like that. The only hang-up I see is on holds. While you can place holds in the system on different items, I don't think there's a really good way to see if anything is on hold other than just viewing the entire collection and looking. Kind of a bummer. But maybe that'll get updated later. So for librarians out there or CERC staff that know what a pick list is or a request to fill list, you, you really don't get that with web librarian. You just kind of have to look. The, the thing is, is if you don't want to allow holds at all, you could just sort of turn that off. Finally, stats. Because if librarians love anything more than books, cats, and wine, it's stats. You can get basic search stats right there in the system. At the very least, you can find out how many items in each circulation type were checked out for a given period of time. Now then, keep in mind that I've skipped quite a few things here and there to keep this show under two hours. I recommend that if you have, the, uh, if you have access to the ability to set up a self-hosted WordPress site, even if it's on your own network, do it. Then install this plugin and start playing. The documentation is short. It's only like 20 pages or so. It's not 100% complete, but what's there is absolutely useful. 
It's pretty simple, it's easy to use, and it's amazing. Oh, hey, and it's free and open source, too. Like the items you'd put in it, check it out. Web Librarian is a great solution when you don't need a full-blown ILS, but what if you do? These days, there are some hardcore solutions out there for you, and they cost nothing. At least not for the software. As always, you'll need a server and probably an internet connection and that kind of thing. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to a small library that's actually a bit larger than just a room, you might want a fully capable ILS. So, okay, you've got some hard hitters like Koha and Evergreen. I'm not going to get into those because for our needs, they're a bit heavy. However, if you're looking for some kick-ass solutions to your ILS needs that don't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast for links to Koha and Evergreen. They're well worth investigating. Instead, we're going to talk about another FOSS ILS that is feature-rich, but a bit easier to use. Unlike Web Librarian, however, this is closer to what most library tech folks would call a true ILS. It uses mark records for items, produces a variety of stats, notices, and requires a higher level of management. However, it's still light enough that it will work on a decently kitted out Linux server. It's called OpenBiblio, and it runs on a LAMP stack. For those who don't know, LAMP is short for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. For the most part, everything done in OpenBiblio is done right through the browser. This is actually a trend among modern ILS packages. Even Polaris is making moves towards the browser with its Polaris Leap system. Now, without getting into the sort of details, there are very good reasons to have your ILS run in a browser window. Among them are the workstations. You don't need some big, powerful PC running Windows or OS X or even Ubuntu. You could make a workstation out of a cheap Chromebook or a tablet. The work is being done on the server rather than the client, so as long as your workstation has the capability to run a browser in an acceptable manner then your workstation is fine for this. That's great in a school environment where they might not have the money for expensive computers. It's also good for nonprofits as your volunteers could literally bring their own devices. The standardization of the ILS happens at the server. So when you're working in the browser, you're able to keep things consistent across the board. Okay, so back to Open Biblio. This ILS is still in development, but it doesn't see releases as often as some people might like. However, I've used it in a couple places, and after the initial setup, things worked fine. Since it's a web-based system, setting it up on the server takes some doing, and you'll definitely want to check their wiki for installation instructions. This is one of those rare instances where I'm just going to have to come clean with you and say, hey, it's really going to help you if you know what you're doing with Linux. If you do, you'll have this thing up and running fairly quickly. Last time I set it up, it took me, I don't know, maybe about half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, that was with me doing things wrong here and there and forgetting that I had to do A before B or something like that. So, yeah, it's it's not bad, but it's it's not it's not like WordPress. So you're going to need to set up a MySQL database for it to use. That in itself can be a thing, and while I sort of know what I'm doing with a database, I try not to go anywhere near MySQL without PHP my admin. Since everything in OpenBiblio is done through the browser, I figure I can manage the database that way too, which is through the browser. For those that don't know, PHP my admin is basically a sort of graphical interface used through the browser to manage your MySQL databases. It's sort of like, uh, this is sort of a poor example, but it's like comparing it to uh, Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, but it's nowhere near that powerful. Unfortunately, OpenBiblio doesn't have that one-click installer like you see with WordPress or Anchor CMS or Drupal or anything like that. You gotta go manual, 
But once you're set on the server, you're set on the clients because all they do is access the server through a browser. Follow the instructions and allow yourself some time. Open Biblio comes with an online catalog that also updates on the fly. As you add items to the catalog, they'll start appearing online. And this is where we get into the meat of Open Biblio because it uses Mark, full on Mark. There are a few ways to get Mark into your system for your bibliographic records, but we'll take a look at two. The first is an add on called LOC Lookup Patch, or Library of Congress Lookup Patch. You'll find a link to it in the show notes, but what this thing does is provide Z39.50 capabilities for Open Biblio so you can pull MARC data straight from the Library of Congress. This allows what librarians call copy cataloging, where you take some basic MARC data, make it your own, and then make whatever additions or changes you need to do. The other way is to simply get MARC records from other sources. You can pull them off the website of the Library of Congress, and there are tools in the show notes to help you make MARC records out of Amazon data. The thing is, if you do make a MARC record, you'll probably want to edit it. And unfortunately, you can't just pop it into a text, you know, a text editor and make your changes. Oh no, that would be way too easy. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm showing my distaste of Mark here again. Anyway, you will, uh, you'll need a Mark editor, which can open and save and export and combine Mark records. But like Professor Farnsworth, I have good news, everyone. There is a fantastic Mark editor that's so good, librarians use it for their big, expensive ILS packages. It's called, creatively enough, MarkEdit, and it edits Mark records and does a damn fine job of it. I've used it, my coworkers use it, and for what it does, we love it. Then again, that's kind of like saying we love scalpels because they're so sharp. Oh, sorry, doing that Mark thing again. Anyway, Open Biblio is very much like your traditional ILS. Mark records become bibliographic records to which you add your item records. You can assign locations, though Open Biblio really isn't set up for a huge library system. If you're looking for something that'll handle a large consortium with lots of branches, you should probably check out Evergreen or Koha. For something less ambitious, say a school library, Open Biblio could be your jam. Where I could easily see one person running a small library on Web Librarian, Open Biblio might take a couple of people. And it'd be really helpful if one of them happens to be a librarian. At the very least, there should be someone there who's fairly knowledgeable about cataloging and mark record manipulation. It wouldn't be an insurmountable task for a single person to do everything, but a little help wouldn't go unnoticed. No matter which one you choose, keep your eyes out for other alternatives. After all, maybe you don't need an ILS at all, and a simple spreadsheet might do the trick. If you're only looking at a few dozen items, or maybe even a hundred items, you know, a Google spreadsheet might be just fine. Also, check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast for a great article by Emily Van Buren that was published on the website for Inside Higher Ed. She lays out seven apps for cataloging your library, and most of these apps include lending functionality. If the idea of an ILS in any form sort of makes your head spin, then one of these apps could be your answer, and they're all very inexpensive. And that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in and wish you the happiest of holidays and the best for the coming new year. I hope it's filled with peace, happiness, and love for you, for your loved ones, and for everyone in general. And hey, I hope you picked up something on how to set up an ILS because the fact of the matter is, is these things can be a lot of work, but they can also save you a lot of work in the long run and make your materials more accessible to the people that you want to share them with. So by all means, give some of these things a shot, download them, play with them, try them out. If things go sideways, you can always blow things away and start from scratch. 
The song that you're listening to is, of course, Titles, also known as Chariots of Fire by Vangelis. In my off time and when I have time, I'm a musician, and every year I cover a piece of music and record it for the people that I work with as sort of a Christmas present for them. And it's also a Christmas present for you now, too. So if you happen to like the song, you can check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. There'll be a link there so you can listen to it online or you know, download a copy for yourself, or whatever you would like to do. I hope you like it. Earlier in the show, you heard Starlight by Psychedelic Pedestrian, Readers, Do You Read by Chris Zabriskie, and Note Drop by Broke for Free. As always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Ibisu by Ryo Miyashita. Check the show notes, you'll find links to all of that good stuff there. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Great people doing great things, and we thank them so much for hosting this show, other shows like it, and things that are not like it at all. So check them out at archive.org. If you happen to like getting your audio from YouTube, you can check us out there. We're youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. Or if you happen to need to get in touch with me, I am on Twitter at Vibrarian. That's like librarian, but it starts with a B. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian, on Google Plus at slash plus Daniel Messer, and cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com if you just want to send one of those old-fashioned emails. I'm always receptive to show ideas, questions, notes from my fans and listeners and people who don't like me at all. But hey, it's about time to get out of here. And once again, I wish you the happiest of holidays, the best for the coming new year, and remind you that you don't have to be high-tech to be low-budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there. <laughs>